And um, I'm glad to see so many people on the call this evening um, and those that are taking the time to uh, listen in to the call, um, to the recording. Uh, we welcome you all. I am Elizabeth. Um, I'm also known as B. And um, I am a rites of passage guide. And it's an honor for me this evening to um, introduce you to Callie Brown, who is dear to my heart. Um, she's actually my niece as well as um, a special cohort of mine. Um, Callie is uh, a vision, a, a rites of passage vision quest guide and um, is a wonderful uh, ceremonial midwife who's quite talented and heart-centered and it's a privilege to have her this evening um, sharing the story of Vasilisa with us. So welcome to you all and welcome Callie. Thank you, Bee. Here's the introduction. Yeah, good to see everybody's faces, people filtering in. And I am, just to speak to where I am in this physical place at this time, I am in uh, Tennessee, in Flag Pond, Tennessee, and uh, the, there's a state park just about five minutes from where I am, and a beautiful river, and it's on Cherokee. So I feel really grateful to be able to be with all of you in this way. The benefits of, of COVID is getting to connect with people all over the world and all over the country. So, yeah, so we're going to do a story tonight, have a little story time around the, the sacred fire, so to speak. Uh, and some of us may have a fire. I have a wood stove at my house. Some of us have candles and there's always a fire in our heart. So just taking a moment to connect all of us and that fire in our hearts as we're circled around for this story. And to take a few minutes to talk about medicine stories before we get into the story. And what is a medicine story? And some of you have probably come to these events before and may be familiar with story and medicine stories. So I'll just speak briefly about that. But one of my teachings around storytelling is that to understand a story is to uh, mean that it's dead. So to really fully understand a story, it's no longer alive in us. And that stories, especially medicine stories are not meant to be understood rather that they live inside of us and they're very much alive uh, and that we return to them again and again at different points in our lives with the intention of deepening into whatever the wisdom is that that story holds for us at this point in time. So I've been tracking this story and it's been tracking me uh, for a little while now. And I've been uh, working with, uh, as many of you might be familiar with the book, Women Who Run With Wolves. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful book. And um, Clarissa Pinkola Estes uh, is the author for those of you who may not be familiar. And she is a, a incredible storyteller, anthropologist and work and um, PhD. And this story is Vasilisa, um, Vasilisa the Wise. Um, and it comes from, it originates um, as far as we can tell from Romania and Poland and the Baltic countries. And some, there's some evidence to suggest that it even dates as far back as um, pre-Greek um, horse goddess cults. So it's a very old story, to say the least. And I named the, the Women Who Run With Wolves because that was the first place that I came across this story. 
and uh, recently have returned to it and have been working with the story in a, um, a women's circle that I'm in. And there's been a conversation about intuition. And I've noticed that this conversation has been showing up in many, many different places in my life. And so when I was asked to do a story for tonight, um, this was the obvious choice to do this one around intuition and the way in which um, in my own life, I'm returning to this, this place of remembering my own intuition and the power in that and the power that we all have um, and that each one of us holds in returning to our intuition. And you know, to, to share a bit more about um, as we're, you know, deepening in and we get to hear this juicy story that I feel really excited to share, um, to notice where you enter the story, where your attention, your mind, your heart enters this story and where it might leave. Perhaps it reminds you of another story or another memory, and you're no longer in this story. You're somewhere else. And so where your attention leaves the story and to also notice where you have memories, sensations, feelings, images that might show up in your own psyche, in your own awareness, and connecting to those parts of the story in your own stories. So we will begin in just a moment, um, dive into this story, Vasilisa the Wise. We will pause a couple of different times throughout so that we can share and deepen into conversation about the story. And does anyone have any questions or Anything that they're feeling really pulled to share before we dive in? Um, is this the same as Vasilisa the Beautiful? That's a Russian there. Yes. Okay. Yes, it goes by different names. Um, in fact, thank you, Deborah, for saying that. Um, it has become in modern day culture Cinderella, in fact. And so it's evolved in many ways. And um, yes, one of the names is Vasilisa the Beautiful. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's dive in then. Hmm. So once there was, and once there was not, a girl named Vasilisa. And this girl named Vasilisa had a dying mother. The mother was very ill and she was on her deathbed. And Vasilisa and her father knelt beside the mother's deathbed and shed tears and mourned for the mother had been ill for a long time. And it was time for her to go. And Vasilisa's mother beckoned to her, come here, my child, she said, come here. Vasilisa, being who she was, and the obedient daughter that she is, walked over to her mother's side and knelt down beside her mother and said, yes, mother, what is it? She said, my daughter, I have something for you. And she reached into her pocket and pulled out a doll. And this doll was wearing a red apron and black shoes, shiny black shoes, and a white blouse, just like Vasilisa. 
Vasilisa was also wearing red apron, white blouse and shiny black shoes. And the mother said, daughter, carry this doll in your pocket. This doll is for you. And if ever you should feel afraid, if ever you should be uncertain which way to go or what choice to make, consult this doll. She is with you and she will know the way. And with that, the mother took her last breath and was dead. Now the daughter Vasilisa and her father mourned for a very long time. It was spring and then summer, fall, winter, and then spring again. And finally, in the following spring, the father remarried. And he remarried a woman with two daughters. And so Vasilisa now had a stepmother and two stepsisters. Now, these three seem nice enough to the fool's eye. For what could be perceived under their polite smiles could only be perceived by some and was not perceived by the father. And so in their own way, they despised Vasilisa. They despised her for her beauty, for her innocence, for her awe that she had for life. And in this way, when the father was out doing his fatherly things and fatherly duties, they were very cruel to Vasilisa. Vasilisa, they would say, clean these dishes, wash this floor, cook for us, for we cannot and you must. And Vasilisa being who she was, Yes, stepmother. Yes, stepdaughters and sisters. I will, I will do this. And all the while, humming along, singing with the birds and going about her way. Now, the two stepmother, the two stepsisters and the stepmother conspired. They were sick of Vasilisa and they thought, ha, let us conspire. We will make the fire go out in the hearth and Vasilisa will have to go out into the woods and meet Baba Yaga, the witch. And she will certainly kill Vasilisa if she doesn't die first on her way to see Baba Yaga. And so, when Vasilisa came back into the house, there was no fire in the hearth. Vasilisa said, stepmother, the fire, it's gone out in the hearth. You stupid girl, she said. Of course the fire has gone out. And I am too old to go into the forest. And my, my daughters, they don't know the way. So you, you Vasilisa will have to go. You will have to go into the forest and find Baba Yaga to get this fire or we will all die. And Vasilisa being who she is said, okay. Okay, stepmother, I will go. And with that, she grabbed her cloak and walked out the door. And so I just 
want us to pause here for a moment. As Vasilisa is walking out this door and noticing what you're noticing, any images, sensations, memories, places you entered this story or left this story. We're going to take a couple of minutes uh, and break out into some smaller breakout rooms. Sometimes the larger group can feel like a lot um, to share. So we will, uh, especially if you're an introvert like me, so you will um, just have some time with smaller groups to share. And I'm going to post some questions in the chat box. And you guys can refer to those or talk about anything else that's present. And then we'll bring you back in a few minutes. And I encourage you uh, in the small group, it's always uh, an adventure to be in front of others. So if you don't feel like sharing, just share that with your group and just sit and listen. Um, and, and enjoy the ride. So I'm gonna offer the breakout rooms now. We'll see you in a, about 10 minutes, we're thinking. What are the questions we're supposed to be responding to? They're going in the chat. There's them in the chat. Like we've got Deborah here. Yeah, Deborah, did you get invited to a breakout room? Deborah she looks like she might be frozen. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And Grace, Justice, Grace, are you with us? Your mute is there. Need to put Grace in the waiting room. I'm not sure if she can hear us. Okay, I'll move to waiting room. Oh, there she goes. I just put her in. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the time now is 7.21. So 7.20. Maybe 7.30 would be a good. Yeah. I don't have audio or video working on my computer tonight, says SM. Chat in the chat box, right? Yes. Thank you for doing the. I was going to do that. That was my job. <laughs> beat you to it. You did beat me to it. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, welcome back. There we go. Hello, everyone. So as people are, we're all coming back together, we take a couple of moments and somebody um, 
whoever feels inspired or open to sharing in the larger group, a person from each breakout room, so a representative from each breakout room um, to volunteer to share what was alive in the breakout room. And we may not get through every room, but we'll take a couple of shares before we jump back in. I, I can share before I forget. Yeah. And okay, so one thing was that we were trying to remember at the very beginning, you said something about stories, that these stories are dead. And, mm. and we, I was very confused about that. So mm. I kind of know what you meant. And then can I take the other two points? And then, then there was, um, we talked about how we felt when, her, her, I forgot her name, this, whatever, Vasilisa. Vasilisa, this yeah. Vasilisa, when she just obeyed her mother and, well, didn't, you know, she, but she put on her coat and went, was going to go outside and how we felt about that. And some of us felt like kind of rebellious, like, hell no, I'm not going outside. And I, and some of us felt like um, she was trusting and mm. just um, believed and very, just very trusting in the universe. And then there was something else about, oh my God, I think I forgot. It was the third thing that we talked about. Well, if you remember while I'm sharing about the story, um, feel free okay. to chime in. All right. Thanks. Thank you for asking about the story. Maybe it may have not been clear in the way that I said it, but what I was saying or attempting to say, att intending to say was that this idea that stories or medicine stories are alive within us. And if we completely understand a story, if it's understood, it has no magic or mystery left then it is understood to be dead. And so that stories really aren't meant to be understood in their entirety. Okay, thanks for clarifying yeah. that. I'm not sure yeah. what it means to me yet, but I can, um, something to think about. And that's I did, great, if there's more questions, that's great. <laughs> so it's not to be understood. And once it's understood, then it's really not, meant for me for me anymore kind of okay yeah. so the other the other thing was intuition the the doll that we somebody thought that the, the doll might be represent intuition mm. and we were all thinking that we want to get a doll <laughs> <laughs> or something yeah that's it beautiful thank you ann it's yep. like Brian says, yeah, stories that's... express our inner archetypes through narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Belinda, did you raise your hand? Yeah. Hi. Um, hey. I'm happy to share. Um, yeah, I think a few things were kind of alive, and one of them was the way the story connected us, I guess, different kinds of threads. So, one person um, had the memory from hearing a similar story in childhood and was kind of instantly transported back. And I thought, huh, almost like the story is the doll in your pocket. Mm. There was this remnant, you know, there was something, something left that could be so easily retrieved. Um, and then we were all, you know, or, or we were sort of, most of us were connected through the parts of the story that we noticed, you know, we kind of resonated and there's always that amazing strange familiarity that arises like oh when the father is out that was notable to all of us um and the same point as what you mentioned Anne you know that oh she just did what she was told being Vasilisa you know she she just did it you know and that those two points were so uh, remarkable to all of us and why you know so I think that was mostly what was alive for us and but just I think for me feeling connected you know by this process and feeling connected by memories and of stories in, in youth and connected by the sort of shared noticing. 
Yeah. Mm, I'm thinking of that. You're welcome. Great. Yeah, similarly, one thing that came up in our group was th this noticing of, of Vasilisa's way of being, of, you know, re responding to the mistreatment and with, you know, the, uh, you know, kindness and, you know, w willingness, obedience, generosity. And, you know, th there were mixed feelings about that. You know, some of us shared about how that ha wasn't necessarily our personal strategy <laughs> when re re relating to people who were not kind to us. And, uh, you know, some wondering about like whether it's better to stay in that loving innocent place preserve that sense of wonder whether it's better to push back on mistreatment like where is there less harm like just noticing what vasilisa's choices are and also a lot of curiosity about this baba yaga and what what vasilisa is going to encounter out there mm -hmm. thanks grace we'll take it looks like we have two people with hands raised so we'll take those two um, let's see, Bev. Um, yes, we uh, talked about her father and we wondered about her relationship with her father and also the relationship of the stepmother and stepdaughters to the father, but how he could be so unaware of what was going on. Uh, so we, we talked more about her father. We want to know more about him and if he comes back in the story. That's it. For me, anyway. Great wonderings. Thank you, Bev. Yeah. All right. And let's see. It looks like somebody has their hand raised, but I'm having trouble seeing. Oh, is it Cody? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, so this is an interesting share because and it's like, it's so perfect for this story too. Okay, so I was just meeting another woman in the group and we didn't know the prompt or anything. We didn't know what we're supposed to be talking about. And she shared, she was like, yeah, I'm kind of doing a lot of other things right now, honestly. And I was like, cool, like, that's not wrong, you know? And I was like, I, I actually had all this poetry flowing through me while you were telling the story and I was typing it. And I was like, wow, this is really different for me because in my childhood, I was extremely obedient and like the perfect student and like always knew the right answer. And like this time I'm like, oh, OK, well, I guess it's just us here. Like what what's alive for us right now? And so we talked about that and we ended up talking about um, relational programming and like programming around love and relationship, because that's really my like passion. Um, and I just thought it was actually really beautiful of like the piece of um, I can't, can you please say her name for me again? Yeah, Vasilisa. Vasilisa and like yeah. that obedience and um, my friend, my new friend and I, we talked about like the people pleaser and that obedience. And then oh, I was really just grateful that I have stepped out of that um, energy for my own life. And so just wanted to share that. The rebel. Yeah, sacred <laughs> rebel. The joy in that. Yeah, the yeah, sacred rebel. Love that. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I don't know the right answer, but here I am doing my own thing, and it is the right answer. Mm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Oh. I'm sure, there are more, and we are going to dive back in. So let's see, where were we? Oh, yes. Okay. Vasilisa, in the woods. And Vasilisa is walking through the woods on this path. And she comes to a fork in the road, not sure which way to go. So remembering her mother's words, she reaches into her pocket and feels the cloth of that doll and the doll says to her, yes, child, to the right, we must go north. And so Vasilisa goes north. And at every fork in the road and every turn in the trail, she consults this doll. And the doll lets her know which way to go. 
mm, south, north, around this river bend. And Vasilisa continues to walk for a while. And suddenly, a man dressed in white on a white horse gallops by. A little taken aback, she pauses and wonders, hmm, curious, who is this person? And without much question, she continues on. And as she's walking, she comes across a man dressed in red on a red horse galloping by. And suddenly the sun is rising. And so she thought, ah, glad the sun is up. It's no longer dark. Strange about this red, red dressed man and red horse. And she continues on her path. Now she's walking, walking deeper and deeper into this forest, consulting her doll every step of the way. She encounters a man dressed in black on a black horse. And suddenly it is night. As Elisa sighs, hmm. Night again. And she continues walking, allowing her doll to light her way. And she comes to a clearing and comes across Baba Yaga's house. Now, Baba Yaga's house is unlike most houses for the foundation are chicken legs and the roof are vines wrapping round and round. And the fence around this house are lined with skulls. Baba Yaga herself, now Baba Yaga herself is a fearsome creature with long, dark gray hair and long yellow fingernails that if she were to curl her hand would not curl into a fist for the length of these nails and a long pointed nose with warts on top. And she rides in a spinning cauldron. And as Vasilisa approaches Baba Yaga's home, Baba Yaga descends. And she says, what are you doing here? And Baba Yaga looks at Vasilisa and Vasilisa says, well, grandmother, I've come to get the sacred fire. I was told to come and get the sacred fire. Baba Yaga looks at Vasilisa, giving her a good once over. <laughs> and what makes you think that I will give you the sacred fire? Vasilisa starts to answer, but pauses, remembering to consult her doll. And her doll says, well, grandmother, because I ask. Baba Yaga says, lucky for you, that is the right answer. But first, I will need you to do some things for me. I will need you to clean my dishes, make the stew, chop this firewood, and make sure that everything is in order when I come back. And if not, and Baba Yaga's eyes turn to red flames staring into Vasilisa. 
If not, then you will be my stew. And you will be dead. And with that, she flies off in her spinning cauldron. Now Vasilisa feels overwhelmed. How am I going to get all of this done by the time that Baba Yaga gets back? How am I going to do all of these? I'm just one person. Fortunately, there is the doll. She consults her doll and the doll says, don't worry, you can rest now. Everything will be done. You can close your eyes and when you awake, everything will be in order as it needs to be. And so Vasilisa coming to learn to trust the stall, closes her eyes and drifts off into a dream. Dreaming and dreaming. And then she awakes, opening her eyes and sure enough, everything is in order. The stew is on, the house is clean, and everything is ready for Baba Yaga. All in good time. And Baba Yaga comes in expecting something very different and being surprised at the state of her home. Well, my little one, you are a clever girl. I suppose I will eat this stew. Although there is one more, one more task that you must do before I give you this sacred fire. You see outside the window there, child, you see those puppy seeds in that dirt. Well, I will need you to separate all these poppy seeds from this dirt. And if one is left, then you know. And Baba Yaga goes into her room and eats her stew and rests a while. Well, Vasilisa knows to consult her doll. And reaching into her pocket, she feels the doll and the doll says again, you can rest, dear one. Everything will be taken care of. Don't worry, all is well. And so Vasilisa closes her eyes and drifts off. And when she awakes, sure enough, there are two piles one of dirt and one of poppy seeds. And not one is still in the wrong pile. And Baba Yaga comes out and she says, ha, you are quite clever, little girl. How did you do this? Never mind, never mind that. How is not really so important. You though are wise beyond your years. You seem to have this wisdom that a girl of your age and who you are should not. Where did you get to be so wise? And Vasilisa says, well, grandmother, I learned from my mother who gave me this blessing. Blessings, Baba Yaga says, blessings? Oh, we will have no blessings in this house. And with that, she gives Baba Yaga the sacred fire and is on her way. So Vasilisa, now with this fire, begins her journey home. So we're gonna pause there. 
at this next spot of the return. And we'll do again what we've done just a few minutes ago. And I'll have some uh, different questions to put into the chat box. And we'll take another few minutes and then we'll join together again. Okay, I have <clears throat> um, some of the rooms had uh, a smaller number. So I've, I've tried to keep you with the person you were with, but also included you in a larger group. Um, I think there's still a room with two. Um, um, are the questions in the chat box now, Callie? They are going in there right now. Okay, I'm gonna pause the recording. The archetype, the shadow, the shadow archetypes. And yet for me, I'm curious about like what the gift is, you know, the gifts in the shadow and that, that a lot of this story has to do with with that maybe, you know, that, that kind of came out. I, I can't remember what we were talking about. Um, John, do you have any nuggets from our group? You're muted, John. It, it was in response to the two part, two part of first question, how do you see each character reflected in you? And then how do you see each character reflected in the culture? So the it, it was what you don't like in yourself is sometimes what triggers you about what you see in the wider culture mm. um we had many interesting parts to our last conversation I, I have to say the idea of the talisman that you touch and every you know the generalization of the story just touch this and everything will be okay you know, this will remind you of calm and the ability to sleep and heal. Uh, taking that out of the story. And then um, I think it was you, Belinda, I hope you won't mind me saying, you know, the, the idea of touching the cloth, which Belinda said she'd read the story many times and she'd never ever heard the actual word cloth when she reaches into her pocket. And that was a sudden real sort of moment of identifying the actual aspect of that doll. What was, what was the thing about the doll that allowed her to connect with her intuition, if that's what we're saying. So that was very, very interesting. Yeah, that's the magic of the aliveness of a medicine story right there yeah a couple more um, see a couple in the chat box here yes yeah. and we wondered if they were timekeepers oh yes uh talking about the men on horseback Timekeepers, the dark, the sun, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there was one more. Let's see. Perhaps, uh, yes. Perhaps the men are not men at all and just. Oh, sorry, I lost it. What does it say? Just ah. the illusion of a savior when we are meant to save ourselves and lift others out of the darkness into the light of their true empowerment. Yeah, see, I love that archetype. And I was saying in our group, the men just ride through, you know, they don't, they're not staying around to have really, they, they're on their way to work they're on, you know, when they come home. And uh, I thought maybe besides time, the, the men, you know, the different archetypes of the, you know, Vasilisa looking for the white knight, the red, the, the shadow person, you know, the dark black person that they were stages of relationship with maybe the masculine or something, but I don't know oh. if that's a viable idea or not, but anyway. All viable ideas. Yeah, interesting curiosity. Juiciness of the medicine story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I definitely wonder with the story, I've read it so much in the context of women's groups and women's studies and women's intuition. And it's nice to be in a room 
with you all and just having, just feeling curious now about for the other male bodied or male identified listeners, um, if the distinct absence <laughs> of like embodied masculine characters feel, what does that feel like, you know, for you guys, whoever's feeling guyish today? You know, what does that feel like? Cause yeah, I hadn't really, I was just claimed it as mine and didn't even pay attention to that. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah. Yeah, interesting curiosity there. And Deborah, I see you have your hand up. I, I first I was, uh, it was about rest. There was, you know, resting seemed necessary before a solution could be found. And um, I think that's, especially for our culture, something difficult mm. to believe. Um, but that by just whether rest means sleep or rest means just, you know, sit with something for a while. Um, that, seemed, that seemed to be a pattern that, that when she was with Baba Yaga, but we, but we also noticed um, some Christian words. I mean, prayer or blessing. Um, and so that's kind of seeped into this old story. Um, so that's a, that was an interesting piece as well. Um, and, I, and I found I... I, ha I found this, I have the story in my Russian fairy tale book and, I, and in my book, she has to feed the doll. She has to give the doll a meal mm. um, before the doll will, you know, give her, you know, the answer. So I think it, it's interesting because it depends on the storyteller, right? Yeah. Um, what pieces? Um, you know, you're going to get, that's what makes these, you know, them so wonderful is that, I mean, when you tell the story, you're telling it, you're telling it. And, and if I were to tell it, it would, you know, I would say different things and, and everybody would hear different things. So it, it's, it's more the listening, right? It's the, really the listening to the story and, um, and and what you said from the very beginning, because it's, it, it will bring up something that you're dealing with, right? Um, so it's fascinating. It, it's just, it's, it's rich that way. It's so rich that way. Um, and right, and these stories, I mean, we're told like all over the world, you know, throughout time as teaching stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, you know, thank you for doing this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Um, I see, John, you have your hand up and we might have time. I see some stuff in the chat, some beautiful comments. But, John, I'd like to call on you while we're still here before we close the story out. I was just going to respond to Belinda's question about the yeah. <laughs> Since I guess someone has to. I mean, the, I think my... Uh, it, it's a very interesting story. My, my answer to Belinda would be in two parts. First of all, I think as a, as a storytelling... Um, as the way to tell the story, the, the main characters have been given names, Baba Yaga and Vasilisa. And then other characters don't have actual names, like there's the stepmother, there's the two daughters, there's the mm -hmm. unseeing father. They don't get names because the story is not meant to focus on those people. The real focus here is on the two people who are actually given names. So uh, 
for me, the, the, and, uh, you know, and, and the men who ride through on the horse, I mean, to me, the white man is just the moon rising. The red man is just the sun about to rise. And, and the black man is, is night coming again. I think it's just a, a way of showing passage of time. So to, to me, the story is about two women, but that doesn't make me feel where are the men in the story? There could easily be another story where, uh, you know, the protagonists are two men or a man and a woman, however they identify. So that would be my answer to you, Belinda. It's fairly a fairly neutral answer, actually. Uh, that's just how I see this story. But there will be un undoubtedly concentrating on women will 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 give a chance to explore the female perspective that's what comes out of this story mm -hmm. yeah thank you john all right b i think we need to yeah find keep, where we were keep our pacing back into the story <laughs> all right so let's see where were we mm -hmm. okay and so, Vasilisa, in the woods, on the return. Walking through the woods, lovingly connecting with her doll. Carrying the skull with the fire, the sacred fire. Not walking triumphantly, not walking timidly, simply walking. And as she comes into a clearing of her own home, on the other side of that clearing in the house are the stepdaughters and that stepmother peering through the window. And at first they can't quite make out what they see. And their eyes must be deceiving them for Vasilisa is surely dead, long ago. She's been gone quite some time. Some would say years or weeks. dream times ago. And so peering through that window, a little baffled and confused, they see this bright light coming towards them and rushing out of the house. Vasilisa, it can't be, for surely you're dead. Vasilisa says, I've brought the sacred fire. And the stepmother replies, we've been without fire this whole time. Surely you weren't going to return. Vasilisa walks into the house carrying the fire. Stepdaughters and stepmother adjusting to what they're seeing. And that skull on that staff that Vasilisa carries watches those stepmother and stepdaughters, tracking their every move. And before long, the fire of that skull burns into the eyes of the stepmother and the stepdaughters and they burn into cinders. And that is the story of Vasilisa. All right. And so we have it. So we have a few minutes, maybe uh,
couple of minutes just to share any takeaways and then we'll close. Be mindful of everybody's time. So any, any stirrings or feelings, sensations? as you leave that story and enter this one. Pajana has her hand raised. Yes, I noticed when she left home to get the fire, it was just referred to as the fire, but when she got to Baba Lisa, she said, um, I've come to get the sacred fire. I'm wondering about significance of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something to sit with. Mm -hmm. I loved your telling. Thank you. Um, I loved, yeah, that, that, that livingness part of the story that it doesn't end here today, you know, it doesn't end with one teller, but it keeps going on. And I appreciate the opportunity to feed the story with our attention right now. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I really, the, the image of the sacred fire in the skull watching them um, was, new to me uh, as well in my repeated hearings and readings of the story and yeah made a really strong impression on me so I'm just appreciating it thank you mm -hmm. thank you Belinda um, I see Jeremy has his hand raised oh, beautiful beautiful story wonderful wonderful rendition and I think you know to just kind of zoom it into this moment it feels like when faced with those near impossible tasks, just connecting with that inner knowing, that inner intuition mm -hmm. seems to be the agency that perhaps in this time with all that we've been through, there's really nothing to do but to keep touching the cloth. Mm -hmm. And that those who thought they were in control and were manipulating this global pandemic situation um shall be returned to cinders and i'll be glad when that happens anyway just saying <laughs> i think we should keep touching the cloth and remembering to trust our intuition and our hearts mm. that's my mm -hmm. comment thank you thanks jeremy and ann yeah okay let's see if i can remember so there's two things one is, um, I feel like the stepmother and the, the, her sisters and the witch or whatever that was, um, were, were just challenging her um, to trust more or to trust. And I feel like she came back and she trusted and those were all obstacles in the way, big obstacles, but she just kept trusting. So when she got back home, um, that she didn't, she's processed that she doesn't need to be challenged to trust anymore. So that's why I feel like the stepmother and daughters disappeared mm -hmm. from her psyche. Like, but I also wanna know Callie, is that your name, Callie? I, yeah, I want to know um, if I, how do I know if I understand the story? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful question. And, you know, to, to bring it back to this place of perhaps you're not meant to understand it. And that the questions can live in you and this, it's a very different way of approaching, right? Because uh, we often, we, you know, we have content and it's meant to be understood. 
And uh, so this is, it's not a usual way of approaching uh, dialogue or conversation. And so to, to engage with it in a way that I, you know, I, I will never fully understand this story, um, but I get to engage with it like I am now with all of you and that's a gift. And there's medicine in that for me. Uh, and I don't think that it will be fully understood. In fact, in hearing all of the reflections tonight, I have all this new information about the story Then I'm like, wow, I've never thought about it from that perspective before. I've never considered this piece of it in that way and how rich that is. Um, so I just invite you to hold the question rather than the answer. Okay, because I feel like I understand it. So, um, but that may be like, yeah, I don't know what to do with that. So yeah. perhaps the question of how do I know if I understand? It's question two. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I think of holding the understanding loosely in your palm rather than grasping it, making the story no longer alive. By holding it loosely, then more questions and curiosity can unfold and more threads can be unwoven and more unlayering can be revealed to whatever moment you interface with it. And that's the aliveness of it. And if I add a little something so beautiful, thank you, B, and thank you for the question. Um, this all of, and even actually your reflection, Kaylee, right? That like being here today and, and experiencing this story as a group, suddenly we all have these little pieces of cloth or these little talismans or remnants in our pockets, you know, and we're all bringing these different colors and threads. And so now the story has, you know, another, another life to live, you know, <laughs> off, it, off it goes with each of us, but we're all taking a thread from those with which we've spent this time. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's understanding is maybe feels clear and beautiful right now and you want to hold this understanding but who knows what will happen to it over the weeks and mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Bea, I know we're right at time and there's a couple people who raised their hands so um, let's see Renee and Rachel will take both of you guys and if people have to go you know want to respect that time and um, we'll take the couple that had their hands raised and then we'll close out for the evening. I want to mention real quickly, I am putting the uh, grief ritual information in the chat box. Um, the Rites of Passage Council has a grief ritual this summer coming up. Um, I know that was a part of the story where I left the story um, when the mother died. Um, so I'm throwing that in there. It's just a little Rites of Passage promo. And Renee... You've got your hand up. I really enjoyed this experience and thought it was one of the best pieces of Zoom because being able to quickly get with people and then get back to the hole and back and forth. Um, if we were in person, it wouldn't work as well <laughs> to focus on what people are saying. Um, and I am delighted. It's a whole new way of listening to a story. And I hope to experience it again of when to break, what the question is to ask the group to, you know, the small group to engage with, which they may or may not. Um, and then how to wrap it up within a time frame. So. The process itself has been delightful for me. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you for joining us. Blessing of Zoom and Rachel. Oops, I stopped my video instead of unmuting myself. <laughs> Thanks. What really struck me at the end is that the, when the fire burns up the stepsisters and the stepmother, I think of the fire in Baba Yaga as being somehow connected they're they're of the same thing and mm. I think about how through the trials that Baba Yaga gave to Vasilisa there's this testing of some kind of purity and it's hard for me to put my finger on it you know I, I don't know that I have 
one word or one value that it represents. Um, you know, it's not quite integrity. It's not just bravery. It's not just intuition. It's, it's some combination there. But whatever it is, Vasilisa's character and her way of being are being tested. And immediately the fire burns up the stepmother and the stepsisters as though to say, you didn't pass the test. Right, the test itself is inherent in the fire. It's inherent in Baba Yaga. They can't, I don't think that they can exist in the world without challenging and, and destroying whatever it is that, that the stepsisters and the stepmother represent. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions to that, but I just think it's interesting this thread that runs through the story of the destruction of what doesn't pass a certain kind of test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Well, thank you for hosting both of you. Yeah, my pleasure. Mm. Mm, my heart is full. Thank mm. you all for your reflections and insights and just, yeah, showing up and connecting with each other in the ways that we do these days. Yeah. So if you guys are interested in any other, we'll do more storytelling events down the road. Um, those will be posted on Facebook and also um, on the website, Rights of Passage Council. And um, we also have a women's program, nine month women program that we're doing and you can look more into that from the website. B and I are a part of that and it's um, really been a beautiful experience so far. Uh -huh. And the grief ritual, as B said, is another piece that we're doing in July. So be well, beautiful people, and uh, see some of you soon. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Night.